Welcome everyone. My name is Kim Wyman. I serve as a senior election security lead for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA, the agency that leads federal government's efforts to understand, manage, and reduce risk to the nation's critical infrastructure, including election infrastructure. Our presenters today, Noah Prates and Ryan Macias, are election security subject matter experts with decades of election administration and election security experience, experience between them. Noah and Ryan will provide an overview of ransomware, including attack vectors and impacts with an emphasis on election infrastructure, related risks and available resources. Thank you for taking time to join us and now I'll pass it over to Noah. Hey, thanks a lot, Kim. Pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Noah Prates. For nearly 20 years, I ran elections in Cook County, uh, Illinois. I started prior to Bush v. Gore in the old logistics days, uh, made it through 2016, which begot the uh, cyber era, and, and now I'm working with uh, CISA to help you all buckle down your election security in this new, really tangled, messy environment. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ryan now to kick us off, and I'll be back with you in a few. Thank you, Noah. Uh, my name is Ryan Macias. Um, I am also a subject matter expert uh, consultant to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Um, I have been uh, integrated in the election technology and security um, space for over 16 years. Uh, previously, um, I was the acting director of the United States Elections Assistance Commission's Voting Systems Program, um, where I served there for over three years. Uh, and then before that, I spent 10 years um, with the Office of Voting Systems Technology Assessment at the California Secretary of State's office, um, where I led the election technology and election security uh, program for the Secretary of State's office. And I also served as um, the, the Voting Systems uh, Standards Board's member for the state of California. So I've been working directly in this space, um, dealing with the um, vulnerabilities, uh, the threats, uh, and the consequences of um, election security risks. Um, and so today I am here to present uh, to you along with uh, NOAA um, on one specific risk um, on a deep dive into that risk, uh, which is ransomware. So first and foremost, uh, CISA is the nation's risk advisors. Um, their goal is to identify risks, um, assess and prioritize the risks that you all are facing. Um, specifically in terms of the election infrastructure, uh, we have identified four main risks um, to the election infrastructure and to uh, the elections process, um, or what we call the national critical function of conducting an election. Um, and those four domains, uh, risk domains, are cybersecurity, physical security, um, operational uh, risk, um, and then mis-, dis-, and malinformation. And so um, as we have identified uh, these risks in the election infrastructure, um, it is our goal to be able to bring um, trainings and information and share information with you all so that you can mitigate risks ag against um, each of these four risk domains. And today's focus, um, again, is in the cybersecurity domain um, and how we can mitigate the risk of ransomware specifically. Ransomware is a priority of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and this goes back to 2019 um, under then Director Chris Krabs, um, and is carried forward to now uh, Director Easterly um, because uh, ransomware is an ongoing um, concern, it's an ongoing risk, it's an ongoing threat um, to not just the election infrastructure, um, but across all critical infrastructure domains. Um, and so that would be all 16 sectors, including um, the elections infrastructure subsector. And so um, really what I want to focus on here is what you can see is a document that is called How to Protect Your Networks from Ransomware. Um, this was a document uh, that was developed, as you can see, all of the federal seals that are there. Um, showing the importance of uh, reducing risk in, uh, from ransomware to our critical infrastructure as a whole. This is a whole of nations approach 
um, and all of the federal government has come together to assist you all um, as critical infrastructure assets and uh, asset owners and operators, um, and specifically election infrastructure asset owners and operators um, in reducing the risk uh, that is posed by ransomware. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is a malicious software that encrypts your files um, on uh, encrypts your files, encrypts your data, um, and by locking up your systems. I like to draw the analogy. Um, you know, we all go back to the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, you know, where there were those movies um, where something of value was stolen, and this could be a jewel, this could be um, an individual, it could be your kid, it could be. Um, you know, anything of value. And, and we've seen all of these movies and what ends up happening is this thing gets taken from you. Um, once it is taken from you, uh, the person with malintent, the threat actor, gives a call um, to you and says, uh, I will give you back this asset if you pay me um, some sum of money or if you provide me some information and so on and so forth. Ransomware is no different, um, hence the term ransom in the name. Um, the, the only difference is that this is brought into the digital age instead of the physical um, threat uh, of stealing a different type of asset. But in essence, what is being done is a, a digital asset is taken from you um, and is then requested uh, a sum of funds in order to turn that uh, asset back over to you, um, typically one of your critical assets. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll hit on a few things here today that um, even if the ransom, or excuse me, if the ransom demands are not met, the system remains uh, locked up and you will not get that information. Um, so, uh, what we call an availability attack. Um, the availability is taken away from you. Um, the data may be deleted or modified, so an integrity attack, um, and or the information may have been exfiltrated um, and then released uh, publicly or a confidentiality attack. And so we'll hit on all three of those aspects, um, but understanding that a ransomware attack could be a confidentiality, integrity, or availability attack, um, and in the the uh, cybersecurity domain um, or information security domain, we call that the CIA triad. Um, specifically in elections, uh, we think about some of our critical assets um, and the types of things that may be taken from us uh, from a ransomware attack. Um, and these items could be things such as voter registration data um, or vote tabulation data. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more as we continue on. I want to highlight a few things here. Um, first and foremost, CISA recommends that you do not pay the ransom. Um, there is serious risks with paying the ransom. Um, number one, it does not guarantee that you're going to get your information back. Um, for instance, continuing to build on the analogy that I was giving earlier about the movies and having something taken from you, um, we've all seen in those movies whereby um, the threat actor requests a sum of money. Um, you go and drop off, uh, you know, the duffel bag full of money. Um, and then the threat actor says, you know what? Um, I appreciate uh, you dropping off that money. However, that was the first installment. Um, and so you now have to pay me yet again before I'm going to give back that information um, or that asset, excuse me. And so similarly here is you may pay the ransom and never get your information back. Um, one, just because the threat actor decides not to turn it over to you. Two is they may turn it over to you, but what has occurred during um, the process of encrypting your data is it has actually uh, created an issue where the data has been manipulated such that you can't actually get it restored to its natural state. Um, or if you were able to even restore it to its natural state, it may take so much work and effort um, that it may not be, uh, be able to be usable by the end state. Additionally, um, if you were willing to pay the ransom, it is likely that you are going to be targeted again. 
Because thinking about this from a threat actor perspective is if they know that you are willing to pay, um, then why not come after you again? Um, whereas somebody who may not pay, um, they may not target them again because it is not worth their time or effort. Uh, I had talked about the extortion aspect already, um, but the main thing here is what's on that last bullet. This is a criminal business model. And so the more that uh, people are willing to pay, the more likely that this is going to continue to occur. This is more likely that the sums of money that are requested are going to continue to increase. Um, because anytime, uh, as with any business model, if it is lucrative, it is more likely that this is going to continue to occur. And so by paying the ransom, um, we are likely to uh, not see um, ransomware uh, subside. And so it is really important for you all to build in your incident response plan to work with uh, the people, uh, for work with um, your county commissioners, to work with your IT folks, to work with all of your leadership to develop a, a governance structure um, and decide in advance of something uh, happening to you, how you would end up handling a situation should it occur to you. Now I just wanna give you a couple quick data points um, on ransomware and critical infrastructure, specifically in state, local, territorial, and tribal governments, um, or what we call SLTT uh, governments. Um, this is not specific to elections. This is uh, in the government sector as a whole. Uh, so including uh, schools and other government facilities um, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, number one, it's just become very prevalent in this community. Um, as you can see from 2018 to 2019, there was a 153% increase of reported incidents um, to the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or the MSISAC. Uh, understanding that these are self-reported, so this is only the number of incidents that were reported and publicly available to the MSISAC um, from the SLTT community. Uh, so there may have been uh, a higher increase in actual incidents, um, but this is what was reported. Furthermore, you can see on the graph there um, from 2020 to 2021, there was 348 total ransomware attacks uh, reported to the MSI SAC. Again, I wanna highlight that 348 is what is self-reported. So that doesn't mean that these are all of the in incidents. Um, secondarily is this is actually somewhat of a decrease um, from 2018 to 2019. And this may be because less people um, are willing to actually report. It may be um, that because of the sums of money um, that are being increased, there is a more of a likelihood um, that the threat actor is sitting around on the networks for a longer time in order to get a more critical asset so they can ask for more money. Um, so just because there has been a little bit of a decrease between 2018, 2019 uh, into 2020, 2021 does not necessarily mean that um, ransomware has subsided. This is still a threat. This is still a risk um, that is facing uh, our government um, sector um, and specifically the election infrastructure uh, subsector. So with that stated, I want to run through a few scenarios here. Um, I want to be very clear that these next two scenarios are just that. They are hypothetical, um, but they are types of things that you all uh, should be thinking through of how this may impact you should it occur to your election jurisdiction. First and foremost would be um, a ransomware attack whereby they access your voter records um, and user credentials. Uh, and, you know, many of us are going to think of our uh, voter registration database as a whole. This may not be your voter registration database, which is why we talk about the records. This could be an electronic poll book. This could be um, through another asset that uh, was received through one of your third party providers. Um, so if you think about uh, your um, uh, mail voting lists that you may provide to your ballot printer, um, this could be a ransomware attack that um, may not have actually occurred to you. 
uh, and or on your systems. But the information is locked up. Um, and then when the ransom is not paid, then the information is leaked out uh, to the public. Um, and this is going to create a loss of confidence uh, in the voting process because it is perceived that number one, your election infrastructure uh, has been breached, whether or not that has occurred. And even if it was your election infrastructure that was breached, um, then there is you know, the concern that that is going to have an impact in uh, the integrity um, of the outcome of the election. And so um, you start to get calls from voters and wondering what is going on. And we all recognize and understand it is very likely that most of this information is already publicly available information. Uh, in most cases, as we know, the majority of a, a voter record um, is public data. But the voters do not understand that um, and or uh, may not uh, perceive it um, as such. And so this creates a loss of confidence and um, concern in the overall process. The next scenario um, is a, another voter registration database attack. Um, and the voter registration database loses its availability and specifically on September 27th, 2022. So just prior to the upcoming uh, November election, um, which also happens to be National Voter Registration Day. Why is that important? What we know is on National Voter Registration Day, there is a lot of entities out there. There's social media, um, there's advocacy groups, um, there's organizations that we work with who are all promoting this. And so if your system is down that day, um, your online voter registration system may not be working. You may not be able to add new um, transactions to the voter registration database. And you may have dozens, hundreds, thousands um, of transactions, uh, whether they be new uh, registrants or changes to existing uh, registration um, that are occurring on that day. Um, and so you may not be able to, to input that information um, and therefore you may not be able to get those individuals registered, particularly if you're in a state that has a, a voter registration cutoff deadline. Um, if this is on or around that voter registration deadline, you may not be able to get your systems back up and running in order to input the information and data that is necessary to get that person registered on time um, to meet that deadline, um, which at a minimum is going to create uh, chaos, confusion, and probably a lot of litigation. Next is um, a publicly disclosed incident, um, ransomware incident that actually happened in uh, October of, or excuse me, was disclosed in October of 2020. So thinking about the time frame here, um, this is a month before the election. Uh, Mail-in ballots have already gone out um, and potentially mail-in ballots are already on their way back in. In this situation, uh, where the ransomware hit was on a database that actually maintained and contained um, voter signature files. Um, it also had voting precinct maps, um, but more importantly, thinking through uh, how where the impact is is this county lost some of its voter signatures which would be necessary in order to um, be able to validate um, mail-in ballots that are coming back in luckily in this specific uh, situation this was a subset um, of their voter signatures it was not their voter registration database it was a separate database um, that only maintained signatures that had been scanned in off of the paper records um, that came in uh, via the mail or other ways. And so they had a backup in the actual paper voter registration record whereby they could go and validate the signature directly. So again, um, luckily they had put into practice some of the protective measures um, so that they would be able to recover um, on a uh, in a quick time frame, so that it didn't actually have an impact in their actual um, election. But again, thinking through uh, what this may do to you um, if something like this were to occur. 
The other situation um, that I want to highlight here again, October 18th, six days before early voting and 16 days before election day. Um, a situation occurred in a, a small county um, and it was their countywide email system. So this was not focused directly on uh, uh, the election infrastructure, um, rather it hit the county as a whole, um, but they lost email. And so thinking of the impact six days before early voting um, and 16 days before election day and the types of requests that are coming in via email and the types of things that you all are handling and what this may have on you and your operations should your email go down. Also, it highlights here, this is a um, fairly small jurisdiction um, and uh, the request for ransom was $90,000. So $450 per machine. Um, so if uh, one was to pay the ransom. Um, this is what it would have cost a small jurisdiction. Uh, they decided not to. Um, and uh, overall, the board ended up having to approve over $200,000 um, to get back up and running. So again, thinking about the cost implications of what this may uh, have on you and or your county um, to get back up and running. So what are some of the vectors of attack? How do people get in? Um, there is what we call escalation of big game hunt, hunting um, and going after the large target. And so I had talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, whereby they may be sitting, uh, a threat actor may get into your systems and sit on your network um, and wait around to find out what is the critical data that they can lock up in order to um, get a higher sum of money out of you or be able to lock up something that may be of more value. Um, they may also uh, target um, assets of high value. Um, and so again, kind of thinking about, you know, that hunting of a big game. And so instead of just, uh, you know, uh, going after, um, you know, the pheasant uh, that is flying by you in mass, uh, you're going to sit around and wait to be able to knock off that elephant. There's also ransomware as a service. And this is important because you want to think about um, the scalability of this. And so uh, there may be a threat actor that actually creates what we call the payload or the malicious software, but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily the ones that are going to be attacking you. So it doesn't take this sophisticated actor who uh, to create the software and then a one off, you know, a one by one have this person start to attack. What they end up doing is selling the ransomware to criminal organizations um, in order to basically do this at scale. Um, and so we can see that this starts to escalate and continue to increase exponentially as they sell that malicious software to organizations who will then in mass go out and try to attack you. The most uh, uh, common ways to get into your system are still through email and through phishing. Um, but also through remote, remote access software. So turning on external ports, um, and this may be for uh, really good use cases, allowing your vendor to come in and be able to uh, provide updates or patches for you to be able to share information uh, with external sources uh, like the DMV um, or other health and human service agencies um, and so on and so forth. But turning on this remote access software um, opens up a portal for a bad actor to be able to come in as well, which then goes into that last point, which is your managed service providers or what we in the uh, elections community call our vendors. I mean, I had already talked about that, allowing them to come in to do real um, things that they need to, to do, um, but you may not be the target of attack. They may actually get into one of your vendors, but if they can see on the vendors network that the vendor has access to your system, then they're going to move laterally to get into your system in order to get that higher asset, um, in which case they may be able to get um, a higher um, value or higher sum of money out of the ransom. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Noah to go ahead and uh, finish off uh, the rest of the presentation here. All right, thanks, Ryan. So governance, look, many of you have people like Ryan with deep uh, technical expertise. And it's a good thing because most of us, and I'm speaking from my role as an election official, uh, don't have that. 
when I started in 2000, there was the Bush v. Gore case, and I thought, oh, I ought to get educated on law, and I went to law school. Never did I think that I would need to become a cybersecurity expert. <clears throat> now, luckily, um, you don't have to become a cybersecurity expert. You don't have to know the zeros, the ones uh, to, to get this done. But what you do have to do is recognize your role as uh, chief executive officer of your organization. The buck stops with you, ultimately. So marshalling uh, the partners and the resources to solve uh, the cyber threats that we face, ransomware in particular, as Ryan just went through, is critical. And so sitting in there as your in that chief executive role, uh, you have opportunities to educate the policymakers and budget holders around you about the necessary resources. And able to do that effectively, um, you know, being able to discuss ransomware at the level that Ryan just uh, uh, did is very helpful. But building a team and focusing on a number of uh, certain issues, creating an election security task force, for example, uh, will help you in governing this problem. So co collaborating with the asset owners around you to ensure that everyone understands their roles and responsibilities. Oftentimes that means bringing in uh, the IT department for the entire county. Uh, very few election offices uh, are fully in control of their own assets. Sometimes that will require bringing in um, vendor partners, you know, voting equipment, poll books, sure, uh, but also that IT infrastructure support. You also have the ability uh, to elevate these as priorities in your office, providing staff training on cybersecurity best practices, phishing campaigns, et cetera, uh, will alert the office and your external stakeholders that you're taking this uh, process seriously. There are also opportunities to develop cross-jurisdictional partnerships to prepare and plan for incidents. Uh, I remember in 2016, I recognized quickly um, that we had an opportunity to, to lead a little bit on behalf of local election officials around uh, the country, but I also recognize that we didn't quite have um, the information security chops that we needed. So I partnered with the city of Chicago and we together split the cost of an election security uh, information officer who's been able to do some great collaborative work uh, across the jurisdictions. So, so we've all got a role in this, and a lot of it starts with the leadership at the top. Remembering again, you don't need to know zeros and ones, uh, but you do need to recognize that it's a priority for the organization. So when you just think about risk mitigation, I can, we'll give you this list. And for most election officials, it's the kind of thing you can take and you just hand off to your IT partner. I would suggest you, you go up a step from there. Hold a meeting once a month, once every two weeks with your um, election security task force and discuss each of these items. You know, hey, IT partners, hey, vendors, talk to me about your policies and practices of backups of all our critical systems and, and data. Not, and not simply the data, uh, but the, the software itself, the compiler, um, have you practiced restoring data? Can you get me back online uh, in the event of an incident? How long will it take? How much data will I lose? As, as governor of this, um, you can ask these critical questions, even if you aren't the one who will provide the answers. You can push the organization to implement multi-factor authentication. Often I recognize when it comes to things like email, you're just one part of a county or a city government and pushing them to move the entire uh, domain to multi-factor can be a bit of a lift. There are opportunities to carve out little subdomains, but leaving it on your list, uh, being a squeaky wheel will create progress uh, faster than just handing this list off to your IT partners. This is the exact approach that, that we took. You know, we developed a patch, a patch patching plan and software update plan to make sure that uh, end of life software didn't surprise us that we weren't uh, working with uh, software that was no longer supported. I mean, patching systems is uh, sort of the lowest hanging fruit here that can reduce uh, 
exploits of known vulnerabilities, developing uh, a plan and pushing IT and vendor partners uh, to do this systematically will show uh, real leadership uh, and strong governance. You can then get in a, a little deeper, pull in partners. CISA, for one, is a great one to conduct cybersecurity or risk analysis uh, on the organization. Uh, this is a more formulaic process of sitting down with all the partners, asking a series of, of pointed questions, um, understanding the environment so that you, as the, the governance leader, uh, as the head of the organization, as the person that's um, working with your stakeholders and funders to manage a whole series of risks, really understands what your cybersecurity risks are. Also on your agenda with that team is the segmentation of critical systems. I mean, you do this already in some ways in a physical sense. You've got a giant office, you've got voting equipment, which are in one room of that office or out in another warehouse. Sometimes the uh, voting system itself is within a, another office in, inside of that office with its own set of locks and keys. Uh, segmenting your digital systems are, are similar. What they do is it can help, you know, if you get access to a warehouse, you still may not have access to uh, the voting machines. And if you get into the voting machine room, you can still prevent or limit access to the voting systems uh so software system so really thinking about building this layered approach and again you're not in charge of segmenting your network no. but what you can do is be the squeaky reel with your it partners a couple other things application and allow, allow listing uh will help ensure that you're only going places uh, that you know you want to go that your staff that your part-timers uh, are utilizing your network to go to places that are dangerous and then finally, uh, more advanced, as, you, as you've started to do some of these things, you can perform penetration tests on your system. Now, we did this with a highly advanced one. We did a full CISA risk and vulnerability assessment. Uh, CISA sent out six white hat hackers who spent a week basically owning us. Uh, at the end of the process, we thought we were cute. We said, we sell you on the network. They said, we were here for six days. We weren't hiding, uh, but I'm glad you were looking. Then they also showed me the uh, screenshot of applications that they should have not have been to. They handed off uh, clear text passwords of to systems that uh, shouldn't be passwords shouldn't be passed around in. Uh, and I recognized then that uh, yes, these vulnerabilities are real. Yes, it's possible to exploit them. We can perform that kind of uh, test uh, on systems, but we've actually created a remote penetration testing. Uh, protocol, which is a lot easier lift, both on you at the city and county level and uh, us at CISA it gives us a bandwidth to do a lot more. It'll provide you some significant detailed reporting. Now, also in the governance bucket is helping think through the what if. Now, as election official, we have, or I don't anymore, but you all are all about plan B's, plan C's, and plan D's. You're great at it, you're great at it in the uh, elections environment. You get so good at it that when problems occur on the fly, uh, you're able to respond quickly. We'd ask that you take some of that expertise that you've already got and apply it to uh, cyber or physical incidents so that you are um, setting up protocols to help you detect when there's an incident and then quickly notify uh, the needed people. So on our website, you can go to sisa.gov. We built out this, um, this plan so that you guys can just fill it out. And the idea is to keep fresh, not just in digital format, but in a printed format, all those people that you'd want to contact in what order. Because uh, at the end of the day, these things are going to happen to folks and i know you've told me that it's happened to if not you to your colleagues so what sets organizations apart is the response time their ability to get back on their feet quickly uh, as now prevention is important obviously uh, but detection notification recovery is critical 
we'd ask you uh, to report ransomware, phishing, other events uh, to CISA immediately. Obviously, in each state, you've got your own partners. Oftentimes, the state asks you to report up uh, to them as well. Sometimes there are other uh, deep partners in particular states, the National Guard, for example, or there's a there's a private vendor. From a national security perspective, we would really appreciate uh, reporting us up to us. When you contact CISA there, we've got a, a one see all see policy. As soon as we get in a piece of information, we do share it with other uh, federal law enforcement officials. But because it's also likely a criminal activity, we'd ask you to notify uh, your local FBI or Secret Service field office. This isn't just about getting you back on your feet. Um, this is about contributing intelligence so that we know what's going around the entire uh, elections ecosphere. Most of the information we get is self-reported. Uh, we got great information on information campaigns prior to 2020. The intelligence community was able to operationalize that uh, within a matter of days and push that out back out to the entire election community. That's a testament to your willingness to share. We'd appreciate uh, that continued partnership, certainly in the cyber arena. So preparation, just back to here. Better to prepare for ransomware than to respond. Uh, you've all heard about not, not wanting to hand out business cards in a storm, right? So building the relationships now uh, with your regional CISA cybersecurity advisors is advisable. Now, I know many of you have relationships with your protective security advisors and those work as well. Pick up the phone, uh, call them, see if they can make a, a connection with the cybersecurity advisors. <clears throat> Email vulnerability underscore info at cisa.dhs.gov to sign up for these additional uh, services. I used every one of these uh, in Cook County. They were highly valuable. They signaled to my organization that this was a priority. It also signaled that uh, to the public, to the county, to the funders, that we were availing ourselves of services that would be of no cost to the county. You can certainly get these out in the public sector uh, at significant cost. The opportunity to grab this from um, the government is, is good for the bottom line, as well as proving partnerships uh, on election security. The phishing campaign assessment takes a little bit of time uh, to set up, but when you get it back, you have a good sense of how vulnerable your staff is to clicking on particular types of email that'll let you target um, your training to them. Vulnerability scanning, this is probably the easiest one. We can do every local election office in the country. Uh, takes an hour or so uh, to sign up. Got to get the right uh, signatures on it. Within a couple of weeks, you get a report back discussing what vulnerabilities remain on your websites, the letter level of criticality. For me, uh, this was huge. This was the first one we signed up for because we could real quick. I immediately had a report with the CISA stamp, the DHS stamp that I could take to my county funders and say, look at these vulnerabilities. I need help investing in website security. I was able to share the risk with them. Uh, it, it was so much more effective than just going empty handed saying election security, I need your money. I already talked a bit about uh, remote penetration testing as a more advanced um, uh, setup for you all. Of course, one of our best ways to communicate uh, with you all is through the ISAC. Nearly 4,000 members right now, so almost a majority of the elections community is being communicated with directly through the ISAC. Look, they can set four, four different levels of information sharing. So at the base level, like this is stuff that you're going to see in the mainstream press or otherwise that you might get asked about at the grocery store or church. That's just the, uh, you know, in the news type of email. Along the spectrum, it goes all the way to the end, uh, which are highly technical uh, communications discussing specific vulnerabilities and, and mitigations. 
Those I know we often forward off to uh, our IT staff, uh, I think, but it's important for us to be aware and to avail ourselves of uh, this information. I wish they had these when I was in Cook County. Every time you'd go down to the water cooler, you look up at the little tech board and you see like all those labor relations notices. I'd have posted a couple of these on here uh, outside of my IT office to make sure that they were, uh, that we were top of mind, that they were always keeping an eye on. So these are downloadable at, at our website. Uh, there are ways to uh, continue to keep uh, digital security, election security in particular, uh, top of mind for, for staff and particularly for IT resources who are getting drug in a lot of different directions. To the extent you really have the capacity to dig in or alternatively, you wanna hand off to a portion of your election security task force uh, to, to report back on, uh, this, there's a joint CISA MSI SAC ransomware guide complete with some best practices, incident response policies, uh, highlighting some additional cyber hygiene services and checklists. If I were to do it now, I would have had a couple people on our security team go through these, write me up a brief. Uh, part of the governance is just keeping this as a priority. A few other resources that CISA built, a guide just for election officials, uh, a security resource guide that would details sort of everything that's available out in there, out there. The election's tabletop in a box. Uh, this is a way to exercise some of these scenarios with your staff. We, we did that. I took all uh, 100 of my full-time employees in Cook County during the summer, and we exercised everything. It's such a critical thing to do this uh, in this sort of misinformation and disinformation era. I sacrificed a day of productivity, but we went through uh, a tabletop and a box. And at the end of the day, I had 100 people who all of a sudden understood the holistic uh, security around elections, not just the little parts that they focused on day in and day out, created information ambassadors uh, that were much more powerful, having a better sense of the, the whole than just a little part. Uh, the ISAC put out a spotlight on ransomware, uh, and then the USG put out a, a protecting your networks from ransomware. When we do these in person, we hand these uh, little postcards out. I, I know they're highly valuable. What we've talked to you for 45 minutes, this boils down uh, some of those things. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see risk mitigations. There's 10 items right there. I mean, if, if you're just getting started thinking about like an election security task force uh, within your organization, or with your partners, those are the 10 bullet items uh, that I would start with and see if you can't get your partners to help you develop policies um, and set a schedule uh, around those things. Look, uh, Ryan and I are happy to have been here to discuss these things with you. I know you are managing uh, a large portfolio of risks from mis and dis and malinformation to physical security. I just ask you to look back at 2020 and anything that's happened since. Can you imagine if there had been a real significant cyber incident or an election office had been locked up with ransomware and that was layered on top of everything else? We may be in a different situation. So while you manage your other risks, please do not take your eyes off of the cybersecurity concerns that you all face. I think we can open it up for questions now, if anybody's got any. So the first question that came in, um, do, you, uh, do you recommend sharing incidents of ransomware with the public? If so, recommend that we do so immediately or after the issue has been resolved. Um, I'll go ahead and start with that. And so uh, first and foremost is having um, a incident in, in your incident response plan is having a communications plan. 
And so just as you are planning for an incident to um, occur, one of the things that you have to recognize and understand is how will you communicate that? Um, and so uh, in the incident detection and notification guide that Noah went over, one of the things in there is um, your public information officer or your communications director um, to understand um, how you are going to handle incidents. This has to be a risk-based approach and an understanding of how your jurisdiction wants to handle this. Um, but first and foremost is uh, anything that you are going to share publicly, make sure that it is accurate and concise um, and that it is timely. And so what you do not want to do is come out and say, we've been hit with ransomware. Um, if you were unsure, if it is ransomware, um, what you do not want to do is come out and say, we are going to pay this. Um, and then an hour or two later, make a determination that never mind, we're not going to pay this. Um, the more confusion that you put into the process, um, the more likely that it is to create um, uh, distrust amongst the public. And so again, making sure that you have um, a communications plan um, and how you're going to handle uh, um, a crisis like this, um, utilizing some of the tools that are uh, availed to you, to the elections community. Um, there are some templates out there for crisis communications plans, um, but again, building out and planning in your incident response, what is going to be our approach? How are we going to handle this? Um, and at what points in time are we going to provide updates and information out to the public? So there's another question. How do I communicate the risk to people we work with? So I mean, you can start with consequences, if you like. Um, I mean, the news public reporting is replete with uh, major organizations being hit with ransomware. Uh, major cities being hit with ransomware and just the astronomical sums that it takes to can take to rebuild uh, when and if not paid. Um, then you talk about you could talk about the, the the vulnerabilities and this is all you know primarily you know through phishing, um, but and and we've got another training on that. But we help I would work to help my staff understand like the, how they contribute to the security. Now, I know it's crazy in the election environment. I mean, we have to open emails from almost everybody. We have to open attachments that come from overseas in the form of like uh, pur purported to be what, Yokava applications, uh, many of that coming over email. Um, so I understand that unlike many companies, uh, you guys are hamstrung in your ability to lock some of this down, uh, but there are ways to, isolate uh, some portions of the network that uh, you would use for opening those type of documents. But putting your staff, uh, empowering them to help uh, kind of reduce the risk for your organization uh, by helping them understand their point of vulnerability, okay? There are, this is highly probable uh, because of just, you know, how much of it we see um, and how, how drastic the consequences are for the organization. Yeah, and um, providing these types of trainings to them, uh, as well as conducting tabletop exercises so that they actually get hit with some of these uh, incidents in a, um, a practice uh, case and a practice scenario will also help identify the risk to them all um, and to your staff uh, so that it can build awareness on, on some of the situations. Next, we have one more question, uh, which is why should we share ransomware incidents with CISA? What are the benefits if we resolve the issue on our own? Um, so first and foremost is if you share it with CISA, um, it is going to provide assistance to your colleagues across the country. What we will be able to do is sanitize um, the information. So we're not going to say X county got hit with ransomware and this has been reported to us. Um, Rather, we'll be able to say the elections community is being targeted. Um, we know that ransomware has come uh, into the election infrastructure um, and be able to notify your colleagues across the country um, of the risk and the threat 
um, that is coming into our community. Because if you get hit, it is likely that they are going to target others um, with similar assets, with similar systems. Um, many of our election systems uh, are similar um, in terms of our vendors, um, as well as in terms of our software. And so some of the same vulnerabilities are gonna be shared across the community. As well as from an intelligence perspective, we may be able to identify the IP addresses um, and information of where this is coming from um, so that we can then alert uh, your colleagues uh, across the country um, to be able to block uh, transactions that may be coming, coming from similar IPs. It also provides us what we call TTPs or tactics, techniques, and procedures. So we'll be able to identify how they got in. We would be able to uh, help assess um, what they may be doing um, in terms of being able to identify in hopes to protect it from happening uh, yet again. And so um, while uh, there are uh, definitely um, benefits in assisting you, if you are able to handle it on your own, um, there are still benefits that will be able to help uh, your community and will then in turn allow us to also build tools that will protect you from having this happen a second time or a third time um, and or these entities coming back again. I think that's a perfect conclusion for, for our uh, event today. We appreciate you uh, very much. Let's, let's Thank you all.